Hey everyone, welcome to Church Online. As always, I am so glad that you have decided to join us today. Last Sunday was probably one of my most favorite sermons of the year, at least so far. There's just something about proclaiming the promises of Jesus and the promises that that emphasize that Jesus is bringing a harvest, that his kingdom will come, that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, I just love that and I, and I love the hope that it brings. But I also believe it's necessary for us to be reminded of this promise because honestly, it appears to exist, these promises, they appear to exist in the realm of paradox. And that is a difficult place for people to process. Uh, if you don't know what a paradox is, it's when something is true, but it seems to contradict itself, therefore it feels false. For example, look at this picture, and I'm going to let this tease your brain for a while. Now, my point for today isn't to turn this into a philosophical conversation. Rather, it's to highlight that paradoxes exist in the kingdom of God. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Number one, considering the biblical concepts of free will versus predestination, the question is often asked, did I choose God or did God choose me? And I believe the answer is yes. And, in, and I know that an internal record scratch just happened in a lot of your guys' heads. Now, here's another one. When I place my faith in Jesus, do I exist in perfect righteousness because of Jesus, or am I still a sinner? And the answer is yes. Is the kingdom of God truly here, or is it yet to come? Yes. And last week, we talked about Jesus and this promised harvest. And is there a harvest now, or are we still waiting for it? And again, the answer is yes. Paradoxes. And they all present uh, biblical truths, but they seem to be contradictory to, uh, to us because the realization, our experience of it, is still unfolding. It's a, it's a paradox. And paradoxes shouldn't be a problem for the people of God. If anything, they should inspire more patience and more faith. And so when, when Jesus promises the harvest, we can confidently believe it and wait on him, even though our current experience may contradict it. And, and when we do, I believe that one day we will see the harvest that Jesus promised. And actually, he'll look back at, back at us and say, I told you so. And in Mark chapter 5, Jesus begins to slowly teach his disciples to have this confidence. In Mark chapter 4, again, he promised that a harvest is coming, but now he's going to give them reasons to believe him, even when initially the circumstances don't agree. And I believe this is important for us today, because whether it's news of war or a worldwide pandemic or a collapsing economy or culture, uh, or even with failing family circumstances, sometimes it doesn't feel like the kingdom of God is here. It doesn't feel like there will ever be a harvest in our community. But Jesus assures us, trust me, it's coming. Let's dig into God's word and see this for ourselves. So Mark chapter 5, verse 1 says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones." 
Now for our Glastonbury residents who are listening in, remember last year when we were having a lot of car thefts and our town was having a hard time addressing this because the crimes were being done by minors, which limited the actions available to law enforcement? And how this began to bring a sense of anxiety to our community because we never, we never felt safe, our property never felt safe. You know, that's the sense I get in this passage, but times a thousand. I mean, think about how the man is described. It's this picture of overwhelming evil. Verse 4 says that no one had the strength to subdue him. Imagine imagine this guy wandering around our community and, and not teenagers. It's an evil that cannot be stopped. And I think it would just suck the hope from our lives. But I want to remind us of an important truth, and it's actually our first point for today. Point number one is that Jesus' power is unmatched. Nothing compares to it. And we see that in the following verses. Verse 6 says, And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Two things. Number one, notice the role reversal. This guy went from creating fear to being afraid. And that's because he can't match Jesus's power. Not even close. Number two, notice that that as a last resort, even though he can't match Jesus's power, he does try and challenge Jesus. Did you did you notice that the the very descriptive and thorough name the demon-possessed man uses? It's not because he has really good theology. It's because back then there was this mystical belief that calling out a person's name could give you authority over their life. And it's a, it's a likely it's a desperate attempt to control Jesus. Obviously, it didn't work because verse 9 says, And Jesus asked him, What's your name? And not that Jesus is validating this mystical belief, but rather clarifying, um, no, I have the power. I have the authority. What's your name? And the demon-possessed man goes on to reply, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's kind of creepy. And there's various thoughts about what this means. Some think it connects with the 2,000 pigs from verse 13 and implies that there was more than 2,000 demons in this man. And I think that's possible. But regardless of how many demons were actually present, what is clear is that there were many, many demons tormenting but also empowering this man to do evil. I mean, no wonder no one could stop him. Verse 10 continues, and he begged earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. This is a a little bit of a weird part of the story, but it does teach us something important. It teaches us that the evil that's present in our world, the spiritual darkness, hey, it is not looking to partner with us. It is looking to destroy. It's especially looking to destroy those who are made in God's image, us, us humans. Evil is not our friend. And it will ruin our lives if we allow it to. But that's not what Jesus has come to do. Verse 14, the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. You know what Jesus has come to do? Jesus, as he promised in chapter 4, has come to bring salvation. He has come to bring life, and he has the power to do it. And the greatest amount of evil 
is nothing to him. It, it cannot stop, nor can it stand against him. But do we believe this? Verse 16 says, And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. You know what? Many people don't believe it about Jesus. They don't believe that Jesus has the power. In fact, not only do they not believe it, but they don't want it. Even when they hear that Jesus has the power to fix everything, we or they, we ask him to leave. And I want you to ask yourself, how do you respond to Jesus after hearing his words and what he has done after, the, after each sermon? Do you ask him to leave you alone? I hope not. I hope we respond this way. Verse 18, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And so as Jesus is leaving at the request of the people that he loves and that he came to save, there was one person who responded differently. In fact, he begged Jesus to be with him. And it was the once demon-possessed man. It's, and it's a response of someone who, is, who has experienced the power of God and has been radically changed. Verse 19 says, And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you, how he has saved you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the apocalypse how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. I, I, I love that last part. Everyone marveled. I, I, I picture Jesus turning to his disciples and saying, I told you so. That's what I came to do. Do you trust me yet? Do you believe that the kingdom of God is coming? That there will be a harvest? And I believe the Holy Spirit is asking us this today. Because there is still evil overpowering our world. Maybe in your own life, maybe in your community, or maybe it's tormenting those who you love. And Jesus is saying, I can fix it. I have the power. But do you believe it? Which leads me to our second point. Point number two for today is there's nothing Jesus can't do. As the story continues, verse 21 says, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Okay, Jairus gets it. He's moving in the right direction, believing Jesus has power to change lives. I like it. Verse 25, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Once again, I, I want to speak to our Glastonbury people because I think we can relate to this passage. Doesn't this story describe two people group that exists in our community? People of power and people with resources. And, and both of those things can be helpful in this life, yet the truth is they, they neither can fully satisfy or save us. I mean, how many people do we know that have both, and maybe we're talking about ourselves in this instance as well, but they have both and yet are still miserable. And that's because there are things that we experience in this life, whether it's uh, evil or it's caused by the consequence of sin, that lead to brokenness that we cannot fix on our own, no matter what we have or who we are. People get unexplainably sick. People fight losing battles to mental health. Marriages fail even when the circumstances are ideal. And no matter what we try or what we buy, it doesn't get better. Like this woman, it just gets worse. 
verse 27. And she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Here's an important mini lesson for us. That sometimes the kingdom of God starts with just hearing about Jesus. Which brings us back to something we learned last week in Mark chapter 4. And it's this, our willingness to sow seeds, to share the word, to share the good news about Jesus, that matters. People are watching. People are listening. They are looking for answers and looking for hope, even if it doesn't seem like they respond immediately. And, and let me just real quick suggest an easy way for us to sow seeds. On the YouVersion Bible app, which we, which we highly use here at the River Church and we highly endorse, there, there is this thing that, that is a, it's a daily story and it's right on the, the homepage as soon as you open up the app. And if you go through the story, what you'll see is at the end, it has this verse image. And, and, it's, this, and it's this really easy thing to, to share on Instagram or Facebook, and it looks nice, but more than that, it tells people about Jesus. And I've noticed that when I share it, a lot of people view it, even if they don't respond to it, at least immediately. If you will, they hear reports about Jesus. And I, and I believe they begin to ask, I wonder if Jesus can help me. If you have Instagram or Facebook and you version, Use that feature. Verse 28, for she said, e if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now, for those of us who follow Jesus and so see, this verse should encourage us because sometimes we think people have to get it perfect in order to come to Jesus. And that's not true. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that biblical theology doesn't matter, but perfect theology isn't a prerequisite for coming to Jesus. And this verse is proof because her reason for touching Jesus's garments was based on cultural superstition and not scripture. But at this moment, that didn't matter. What did matter is she was willing to put her faith in Jesus. Verse 29, and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt it in her body that she was healed of her disease. I want to point out the word immediately in this context. I want us to realize that immediately is possible. I want to plant that seed of hope into your heart today. While this is not prescriptive, meaning that it, it's how it happens every time, it is descriptive, which tells us at the very least, it can happen. Jesus can change anything and everything in a moment. He can do it immediately. Verse 30, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. You know, I, I think it's sad. That sometimes people don't come to Jesus because they have a wrong picture of him. They think that he's mean or that he's mad, but he's not. Let me just encourage this church. Make sure you're not contributing to this incorrect picture of Jesus. Because here's the Jesus we need to show people. Verse 34, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Can I say that nothing in all of creation has the power to proclaim this, to proclaim what Jesus said to the woman? It's an offer that is exclusive to Jesus. That being said, this offer is available to everyone willing to put their faith in Jesus. And as Jairus, who has been walking uh, uh, to his house alongside Jesus this whole time and then sees this happen before his eyes, I think that his faith is growing. And I believe he begins to think, you know what? Jesus can definitely heal my sick daughter. But then something changes. You see, his daughter isn't just sick. Verse 35, and while he was still speaking, 
there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And all of a sudden, there is this faith crisis in Jairus' life. It's one thing to heal the sick, but raising the dead? That's impossible. Who can do that? Verse 36, But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. A, A better translation for overhearing is ignoring what they said. And I, and I like that. And then Jesus tells Jairus, because, because Jesus ignored what the people were saying, and then he turns to Jairus and says, you know what, just trust me. Trust me. Just believe. And Jairus, by his actions, replies, okay, I will. And, and let me just stop for a second and say, are any of you at this point, are you having a crisis of belief Is there something impossible standing before you? Maybe even death itself. Verse 37. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Now, I must clarify, Jesus isn't saying the girl is simply sleeping. She's dead. But he is hinting towards something miraculous that is about to happen. Nevertheless, I want to point your attention to the crowd's response. It says they mockingly laughed at Jesus. Now, let me assure you, as a follower of Jesus, this situation is in your future if you haven't already experienced it before. When you boldly live out your faith, someone, maybe even a trusted friend, is bound to say, you you trust in Jesus? You believe that junk? You're stupid. That, that's just a crutch. And first off, my response to something like that is, Absolutely it is, because I am fully aware that because of the sin in my life, I don't just need a crutch because I walk with a limp. I can't even walk. I need Jesus, not as a crutch, I need Jesus to carry me. Now, secondly, I think that this passage shows us a good practical response to those who are uh, have spiritually negative voices in our life. And that response is, do what Jesus did, put them outside. When someone challenges your faith, sometimes the best thing you can do is to ignore them and keep trusting Jesus. Let's begin to finish up. Verse 41 says, taking her by the hand, he said to her, uh, Talitha Kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus has resurrection power. And he's the only one that does. And that means there is nothing he can't do. And notice that it says that they were overcome with amazement. And I picture Jesus once again turning to his disciples and saying, I told you so. That's what I do. I'm bringing the kingdom of God. I'm bringing salvation. I'm bringing the harvest. Do you believe me yet? And so as we close, let me remind you the promise that Jesus gave in Mark chapter 4, that the harvest will come, that the kingdom of God is coming. But we also live in this paradox where our current circumstances seem to contradict that promise. But in Mark chapter 5, Jesus gives us reasons to keep trusting him. And when we do, eventually, he's going to turn to us and said, say, I told you so. That's, this is what I do. I'm bringing the kingdom of God and I'm making all things new. And so what's hopeless in your life right now? Or who do you know who is hopeless? Whoever it is or whatever it is, you can trust Jesus with it. You can trust Jesus with your life, both now and forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you today and we ask you to save us. Whatever that means. 
For some of us, it'll be uh, uh, the forgiveness of our sin and the restoring of our relationship with you. It'll be trusting in what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago and believing that you rose from the dead three days later, defeating death and giving us a confidence that when we put our faith in you and turn from our sins, we too will one day rise unto eternal life. Or maybe it's a salvation from our present circumstances. Knowing that we may not be currently experiencing the kingdom of God, but we can trust you nonetheless because you promise to save. And you promise that one day we will see that harvest. And so whatever it is or however messy it looks, Jesus, we want to put our faith in you today. And so come into our lives and do what you need to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for Church Online. If this was your first time, fill out a Connect card. We would love to say hi to you. We'll even send you a gift. Also, if you have any prayer requests, would like to know more about the River Church, or if you have decided to follow Jesus today, we want to hear from you. And there's an easy way to do that on our website, riverchurchct.com, or you can follow the links in the comments below, or you can text the keyword TRC Connect to 94,000. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day.